The eighth generation of Pokemon games have finally been revealed thanks to the recent Direct. Now we know them as Pokemon Sword and Shield. Not only that, but we've seen the starters and a sizable look at the new Galar region. It's a promising start to the idea of a full-blown Pokemon adventure on the Nintendo Switch. But we know you all, it's not enough. We always want to see more. Well, fortunately, that's why we have the old analysis machine. So let's fire it up as we look for all the secrets and hidden details in the Pokemon Sword and Shield reveal trailer. And we'll begin with our new trainers. While we don't have canon names for them yet, we do get to see where they live. And this might be the nicest home a trainer has ever had. It's a cottage with plants growing everywhere. They line the stone walls, cover the edges of the roof, crawl up the mailbox, and even drape near the front door. Adding to this natural setting is a path that isn't paved at all, instead only featuring a few stones leading to the front door, and a set of stairs made with logs embedded into the incline. Two flower pots rest at the corners of the walls and next to the front door, while hanging plants line every space between windows. There's even a flower garden with a wheelbarrow nearby to continue this love of gardening. There's more to see than that though, as we can spot a curved metal structure near the right tree. We're not sure if it's a gate or a bench, and unfortunately this isn't clarified on the Galar region map. Something you'll notice quite frequently with this new regional map though, is that it's not a one-for-one -one representation of what's in the game. It's useful, no doubt, but not everything will be the same. Returning to the cottage, we want to take a closer look at the mailbox. For some reason, it features the letter C on the front, but we really don't have a clue as to what that could mean, if anything. I mean, we're still trying to figure out why your house has both a mailbox and a mail slot. Entering the house, we then see the trainer's room. They have a TV behind them, which is standard for the player's bedroom, but it's oddly modern, especially when compared to the nearby radiator heater. Considering the design of the house, this radiator seems to help emphasize the rustic feel of your home and the surrounding nature. Still, that's no reason you can't own an awesome flat screen. Beyond the TV and radiator, we can see a Pokeball poster on the wall and a large rug featuring the colors of a Pokeball. There is something a little odd in this scene though, the trainer's backpack, which is much larger than it's ever been before and even designed differently. It looks more like a traditional suitcase as there's even a handle on the side. But is this a stylistic choice reflecting just how much the trainer carries around? Or could there be more options for the trainer's bag? We're not sure what could be added, so we're leaning toward the former. We then get our first look at the male trainer. He's wearing a stocking hat, a red polo shirt emblazoned with some kind of Pokeball symbol on the chest, a green plaid shirt beneath his polo, and jeans with a few fade marks and a tuft of fabric at the right knee. Behind him we see more of his room including a clock, a shelf with a few random objects including a bucket, and a wardrobe with some stickers on the side, including what looks to be a blue and yellow Thunderbolt pennant that seems like it could belong to some sports team. And based off what we see later, that might not be too far from the truth. On the left is a stuffed Pikachu that seems to be taken directly from the trainer's room in Let's Go Pikachu and some kind of poster. We think it's a map of the region, but the scene shifts preventing us from seeing it fully. The transition also partially hides the switch next to Pikachu. It's a bit far from the TV, though perhaps it's mainly used as a handheld. After this scene shift, we get our first look at the female trainer who's wearing a large backpack as well, though not in the luggage style. A later scene shows it from behind, revealing that it's about half the size as the male trainers, but certainly wider, lending further credence to the idea that these are just style choices. The bag itself resembles a wider satchel and, like the male trainer, has an alternate handle to carry it. Otherwise, she's wearing brown boots with green plaid socks, a pink dress, a cotton coat with a hood, and tops it off with a green pom-pom beret. But potentially more interesting is the small animation where she brushes herself off. Is this simply an idle animation, or could she be sorting herself out now that she's decided to start her Pokemon journey? We're thinking the former, but it's still good to see this tiny bit of extra personality in the trainer. There's so much more to see in the Galar region though, and there's potential in the setting as it is based off the United Kingdom. See? All you have to do is flip the map upside down to compare. But let's get to the nitty gritty and start taking a closer look at each of the locations shown in the trailer. And the very first that we see is a panning shot through Route 1. We can even see the route number on the left side. Convenient, right? Otherwise, this continues the natural look we've seen up until this point. 
The route is flanked by two stone walls on either side that are brimming with moss, and there's a small village that can be seen ahead. Above, birds are flying across the sky, though they're purposefully kept non-specific. The camera continues to travel down the route until one stone wall falls away to a low wooden fence on the left, while an overturned wheelbarrow can be spotted on the right. Just beyond that is our first look at tall grass, but we'll see plenty as the trailer continues on. More importantly, we get a better look at this town which features a small bridge to reach it that leads directly to a train station where the train has already arrived. Behind the station and further up the road are two buildings that look more like little shops thanks to their front ends. It looks like they're both displaying something. To the right of those is our first look at the new Pokemon Centers. It has a bit of an older appearance to it, likely owing to the chimney popping out of the top. There's also a blue sign marking it as a Pokemart, but we'll have a better look at this later in the trailer. In front of the center is a home that matches the look of the rest of the town attached to a larger purple building that has a Pokeball above its door. Now, we'll get to that purple house soon enough, but we think the home to the left is just a normal place. We never see the interior of it, but we do get a look at the inside of another home later in the trailer. This is definitely not the same house though. The windows on the left don't match at all, but we have no idea where it could actually be located. It's a pretty typical home with a comfy looking living room featuring a fireplace and two radiators. There are no people around, but there is a Munchlax from Gen 4 here, confirming that Snorlax will be in the game as well. We think that this is the entire house though, as there is a blue floor in the front that marks the entryway. It's possible there's another room to the right where we can't see, but we kind of doubt it. Returning to the purple house, we can see that it's also overgrown with vines and seems to contain a greenhouse on the right side. In addition, there's a fletchling wind vane at the top, something that seems rather popular as the next scene has a closer look at one of these wind vanes. It's not the same one as the roof is a different color, but it's nearby as we can see the stone wall path nearby and a windmill next to that. This also shows off more details such as the wear on the roof fading the color and the straw packed around the chimney, likely from bird Pokemon. Maybe even real Fletchling, Fletchinder, and Talonflame populate Galar. But what is this purple building? Well, we think this is the Professor's Laboratory. Allow us to explain. If we look at the map, we can see our home is next to a large red building that features that wind vane that we just spoke of. But it's also quite the huge house featuring a garage, a small pond, and even a Pokemon battle arena. This could be the professor's lab, but we think this belongs to the game's rival as you typically live near them. Now, it's possible that the rival is the son or daughter of the professor and this is their home, but we'll keep it simple for now and treat them separately. Continuing up the road, we see the farmland that dots this entire area along with the familiar windmill and a curved path that we'll later see features tall grass. It's then that we arrive in this town where the map features the train station and two buildings along with the purple house, but not the house directly next to it or the Pokemon Center. Another sign that the map isn't completely one-to-one -one like past regions. Now, we think this short journey matches past games where the trainer made their way to the professor's lab. It all matches pretty well up until this point. We even see the interior of what we believe to be the lab as there are two stories worth of bookshelves next to what looks to be a kind of giant terrarium. There's even a monitor on the inside, though we only see that it's filled with plants. But the same green bars on this monitor are featured on the monitor on the right side. Somehow, the plants are a main focus of this region's professor. We can see more of their lab around this monitor, which features a desk, a chest with a Pokeball symbol on the front, and a board covered in notes. While we can't make out most of it, we do see a diagram featuring Charizard's head. But what connection it might have to this research, we have no idea. However, we do think this takes place in the purple building in town as the greenhouse-like construction is on the right side, just like we see in this interior shot. So, case closed, right? Well, not really. Let's go back to the map quick. If we follow the path through town, it eventually leads to another purple house, which is placed next to a lake and features another Pokemon battle arena. It's also a dead end. Now, this begs the question, is this actually the professor's lab? Well, maybe. But let's take a closer look at this house first, as it appears a few times over the course of the trailer. The first time it's shown is from the route leading to it. Along with this house, we can see a bench near the lake and a small shack that's further along the coast. There's no indication that we can even reach this shack. It seems to merely be there for the aesthetics. The house itself is positioned next to a large tree that seems to be growing over it as several branches are snaking across the roof. In addition, it seems to feature its own greenhouse as well as small plots of land ready for gardening and a wheelbarrow full of sacks of manure. 
The next scene features the trainer outside the house, walking towards the lake. Here we can see more of the vines overtaking the building, as well as more of the greenhouse, though it's smaller in size. Notably, the Pokemon Battle Arena features claw marks, showing that it's definitely been used for battle. Our final look at this house shows off the shed on the right, as well as the nearby tall grass. It all seems like a more typical house, just with a battle arena outside. But as Professor Kakui showed in Sun and Moon, not all labs are obvious from the outside. So what does all this mean? Why focus so much time on it? Well, we think we're looking at a Pokemon first. We believe that there will be two professors in Sword and Shield. One lives in town, while the other is more of a hermit. One potentially looks at a Pokemon's defensive abilities, while the other focuses on an aspect of battles, hence the need for a battle arena. Now, this might come across as a stretch, but these buildings are far too conspicuous to be nothing, and both are featured in the opening area, where typically not much else is going on besides early opportunities to catch Pokemon and meeting the professor. Both houses could belong to one professor, but that seems unnecessary. So that's why we think there's a chance that two new professors will be introduced. But let's move on for now, as there's still much more to see in the Galar region. And this next scene is a big one. The town we see features strange stones that litter the areas between the fields of grain. As before, we can see more farmland in the distance, as well as a few dotted houses along with some Stonehenge-like structures. There's a much more obvious building to see, of course, but before we get there, we wanted to point out some of the smaller details surrounding this. On the left side is an area that has no grain, yet still features a crate, some farming tools, and random holes. These appear to have been dug up by some kind of Pokemon, so is it possible that there's a minigame where the player has to chase off Pokemon like Bunnelby or Diglett so they don't mess up the fields? It's not exactly something that would happen in past Pokemon games, but the developers did say they wanted to try new ideas, so maybe minigames like this will be featured throughout Sword and Shield. At any rate, we can see a small wagon filled with plants next to the Pokemon Center, which is also where we get our better look at the Pokemart sign. Notably, this center also has a chimney, so this seems to be the common design for the buildings in the Galar region. Okay, let's talk about the stadium in the middle of town. It's massive compared to the rest of the buildings and features a symbol for grass-type Pokemon. One would think that this would make the building the grass gym, and that could absolutely be the case. But there's some definite changes to the structure of gyms in the 8th generation, though we don't know exactly how far-reaching they are. The biggest clue to this is the symbol found on the glass doors and near the entryway. This stylized symbol is the same one found in the Japanese logos for Sword and Shield, meaning this stadium is one of the biggest new elements in the game. Previously, the Japanese logos hinted at Mega Evolutions in X and Y, Z moves in Sun and Moon, and the Krozma in Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. So again, them being featured here is a big deal. With that in mind, let's look at the other instances the trailer shows in this stadium and immediately there's something weird going on. We see the trainer heading directly for the stadium, providing a better look at the symbol. But the Pokemon Center is no longer on the right. Instead, there's a giant stone with two ancient-looking symbols carved into it. This wasn't there before, and this is definitely the same town, so that likely means that there are multiple entrances to the stadium. We believe that it can be accessed from every side. The building on the left is mostly obscured by a tree, but we don't think it's the Pokemon Center, as this place is made from bricks, while the sides of the center are smooth and white. But it does appear that wagons full of plants are a common sight in this town. We also see a stone path leading around the stadium, though the left is blocked off by some gates, even on the other side of the nearby building. Much later in the direct, we see our closest view yet of the stadium, though we can't see inside nor read the language on the glass doors or nearby sign. We can't even tell if this is a different entrance from the previous two. But that's just the outside. What makes this stadium so different compared to previous Pokemon gems? Fortunately, we actually get a look inside. At one point, we see Lucario facing off against Tyranitar in a giant stadium. Clean-cut grass and white lines are everywhere, but more importantly, the stands are absolutely stuffed with fans. There is not a seat in this place that isn't filled, and it's being treated on the same level as a real-world soccer match. Let's Go had an audience for gyms. In Sword and Shield, they seem to be an absolute event. There's a giant screen behind Lucario's head that currently features a Pokeball, although we could totally see it displaying highlights from the current match for the crowd. Not only that, but there's an electronic ad board featuring another Pokeball and a fun Easter egg. The Game Freak logo is displayed with the name written in the Pokemon language, but it absolutely is their logo. It even has their symbol. 
The angle changes as Lucario uses its power-up punch on Tyranitar. We actually see one more advertisement along with the Pokeballs and another Game Freak logo, but we're not sure what this one means. It's in the shape of a C and the design is vaguely similar to the Sylphco logo. Will we see another corporation in Sword and Shield? It would immediately explain where this game's Master Ball will come from, but will this possible corporation have a bigger role than the previous two? We'll just have to wait and see. This new angle also allows for a better look at the stands and an intriguing display above Tyranitar. There looks to be a Pokeball symbol surrounded by red, green, blue, and yellow streamers. While we're sure you're all familiar with why those colors were chosen, the design itself is oddly close to the World Cup logo, creating yet another odd connection to soccer with these stadiums, which we still believe are the game's gyms. And there's still one more scene to see as the trailer ends with the male trainer entering a stadium while dressed in new clothes that resemble a soccer uniform. It's the only time in the trailer that we see either trainer change clothes, though we expect the feature to return. The design of this outfit also has the trainer wear a single glove on his right hand, the same hand that he uses to throw Pokeballs. The symbol of the stadiums is also emblazoned on the arm of the outfit while his number is 227, or February 27th, the release date of Red and Green in Japan. And in case you were wondering, this is the grass stadium that we've been looking at. We can see the grass symbol on the display boards. So the trainer absolutely has a role here, yet we never see them during the fight between Lucario and Tyranitar. In every other Pokemon encounter during the trailer, we can see the trainer, but not here. So that begs the question, how do these stadiums work? Are they indeed gyms or something new that fulfills the same role as gyms, much like the Island Trials in Sun and Moon? And what's the connection to soccer? Could this be more tactical in nature with the trainer in an overhead position commanding all his Pokemon at once while his opponent does the same? We honestly don't know, but man are we excited at the possibilities. Now, we're still not finished with this town. It may be our first look at these stadiums, but as we mentioned before, it also featured plenty of ancient artifacts dotting the landscape. However, none are as important as this giant artwork embedded into the side of a hill. And thanks to the map, we know this is located on the outskirts of this town. There's no doubt that this depicts a legendary Pokemon, but what exactly is this saying about it? We see human-like figures tumbling at its feet while it towers over them. Not only that, but it seems to be breathing fire as well, though there are lightning bolts shooting out from that fire. Could it be possible that this legendary is a fire and electric type? It would be kind of a first as the only Pokemon with this typing is Rotom in its heat form. At any rate, we believe this same artwork will appear in both versions of the game as the exact same art is shown on the Galar map, so the other legendary Pokemon is likely represented elsewhere. Whatever this Pokemon is, it seems to depict a great calamity, but unfortunately its inspiration doesn't provide many clues. The art is based on the Cern Abyss Giant, which is located in the village of Cern Abyss near Dorset, England. References to the giant didn't appear until the late 1600s, making its origins seemingly recent. But unfortunately, nobody really knows what it represents. It could be the Greek god Heracles, or it could be a satirical image of a historical figure. But local folklore has sprung up around it, stating that it's both a symbol of fertility, as well as being the outline of a real giant corpse. Supposedly, when the giant came from Denmark leading an attack on the coast, the people of Cern Abbas beheaded it as it slept. So maybe it's possible that this legendary Pokemon led an invasion of the Galar region, wreaking havoc on the people during the Pokemon War mentioned in X and Y. Perhaps we'll learn more about that event. Or it could be something completely different. But at the very least, we have at least some idea of what one of the legendary Pokemon will look like. Unfortunately, the face of this artwork isn't too clear, but it's possible that it resembles the wolf-like look on the Pokemon Sword and Shield logos. It's at least another clue. And we'll even take a guess that this is the Sword Legendary, as its head is facing left, just like the logo. Who knows, maybe we'll be right. That's everything from this location, and fortunately the next one is rather short. It takes place in a foggy forest that's more than a little ominous, but we never see Pokemon here or any kind of battle. The only other scene is of a Pokeball shaking in these woods. So Pokemon can be caught here, which isn't immediately obvious considering its location. This is actually a very early area in the game, located just to the left of the trainer's house. 
we can see a path leading to a thick forest that has a layer of fog. It's very possible that you and your rival dare to enter this place in the hopes of finding a Pokémon, only to be stopped by a professor. Of course, this scenario isn't a guarantee, but some kind of Pokémon can be caught here. Now, up to this point, the Galar region has been pretty natural with rolling hills, plenty of farmland, and things growing everywhere. But that's not the entirety of the region. We get a look at the first of three major cities, and this one seems to be completely industrialized. Everything is made of brick and coated with a thin layer of rust, but that doesn't mean there isn't any vegetation. We see well-trimmed grass and bushes later on, including during the introduction movie of the three new starters. But nature still isn't as wild here. It's very much under control. On the left side is some kind of sign, though we don't know what for. It could be a store of some kind, or even an entrance to the train station. After all, we do see a train pass through, though unlike the rest of the city, which comes across as a bit drab, the train is pink and modern looking, perhaps coming from one of the northern cities. On the right side, we can see two more storefronts, but again, we don't know what they're selling. Otherwise, the lower level has a giant cog against the wall and a lamppost in the foreground. The camera pans up to show more of the skyline where we can see a taller building on the left that seems to have some kind of small screen mounted at the top. We couldn't say why this is though. There's also the tower to the right that has a Pokeball shaped window at the top. But this is part of a larger structure as we can see a glass dome below as well as rows of chimneys. Looking at this city on the map, it almost looks like some kind of giant factory but it also confirms that the tower is surrounded by a glass roof. While it's not obvious at first, the Direct does reveal the purpose of this building. It's another stadium. We can clearly see the stadium symbol on the building, but this also provides a street-level view of the city where we can see a Pokémon Center, the wide cobblestone streets, a red mailbox, a few shops lining the street, as well as more turning gears. We're still not sure what they do exactly, though we suspect they help power the city through steam. There's also no indication of what type of Pokémon the stadium represents, but there's still a bit more to see of this city. At one point, the trailer shows the female trainer running in profile across a bridge, while we see some more examples of the clean-cut grass and well-trimmed bushes. There's some kind of building nearby as well, though we don't really know what its purpose could be. There's also another train running, though this one is colored blue. We suspect that the different colored trains have different destinations, but a bigger mystery is the advertisement that's revealed as the trainer runs to the right. It shows some kind of food that likely contains berries as ingredients. After all, they're plastered all over the poster, and the actual food has some colorful pieces as well. But we think this is some kind of special Pokémon food, as the dish it's in resembles ones for pets. We'd expect that the player would have access to this new Pokémon food, but can it only be bought, or could players make it in the same way as Poffins and Pokéblocks in the past? We don't know for sure, but we do think it'll have a role in this game. The next location is one of the snowy areas of the map. We can see water at the bottom left, along with some floating bits of ice. That would place this scene near these ice flows. But then there's this wintry city at night, and we simply can't find it on the map. We've mentioned before how the map isn't as accurate as those in the past, but this is a case of us unable to find any location that even comes close. One would think it would be the northernmost city, but nothing matches up, least of all the center area the trainer runs around. Besides, there's no snow in that city. We can see the greenery. We may not be able to find this city, but there are still interesting things to note. For one, there are flags hung along the right building showing a castle turret, a crown, a gear, and a flower. What these might stand for, we can't say, but these do feel like they belong in the Galar region. There's also a food stand of some kind in the bottom right. We don't see the exact type of food, but we suspect that it might be for crepes, as one of the flat tools reminds us of a crepe maker. Maybe you buy crepes for your Pokémon in the same way that you fed them malasadas in Sun and Moon. Then there's the building at the top of the stairs. It features some kind of symbol on the front, but its design doesn't reflect anything we've seen from Pokémon before. Perhaps this is a museum of some kind? We're not sure, but we do know it's night out, so it's very likely that the time of day will change like past Pokémon games. It's not exactly surprising, but it's good to note. Our final unique location features the female trainer inside of a mine. We can see minecart tracks, pickaxes, shovels, lamps, and a bucket. It's all the typical tools you'd expect to find in a mine, but it would be something if we got a minecart minigame in Pokémon. Sadly, it's likely not to be. Fortunately, there's all of these shiny objects to get distracted by. It makes us wonder if the player can actually mine them in any way, 
or if they're simply around for aesthetics. It could work like the underground in the Sinnoh region where players could mine for shards, fossils, evolution stones, and items like revives. While we're not sure if the feature will be included, the shining bits we see do resemble some of those objects, like a max revive on the left and some of the colored shards on the right. Who knows, maybe this is all just preparation for the eventual Sinnoh remakes on the Switch. Eventually, the trailer has a scene where the camera rotates around the trainers in various locations. Though they don't reveal anything new that we haven't already mentioned, it does make us wonder if the camera is being controlled by the player here. And while it does seem that way, we believe this is an editing trick, or maybe something that happens when the player is idle. Every other scene in the trailer indicates that the camera is static and chooses angles for the player. Okay, that may be all the unique locations in the Sword and Shield trailer, but we've still got a catch and battle Pokémon. We're not just tourists. And one of the big revelations right away is that wild Pokémon encounters work exactly as they did in past generations, rather than having them appear in the overworld like in Let's Go. So if you enter Tall Grass, you'll eventually encounter a random wild Pokémon. And this takes place on Route 1, where the trainer has the choice to head straight and avoid the grass, or enter the circular area in the hopes of an encounter. But if she's going this way, why is the trainer sneaking through it? Sneaking doesn't prevent encounters as we soon see. Perhaps the ability to sneak up on shadows in the grass returns here? In either case, there's a wave of energy as she encounters the Pokémon, which could be a visual representation of its cry. The Pokémon that appears is Pikachu, meaning that it could be caught quite early in Galar, as this is a long Route 1. However, we wonder if this is a trick of the trailer. After all, it was Pichu, not Pikachu, that could be found in the early game of Sun and Moon. That could be changed for Sword and Shield, but in this case, we think the developers wanted to feature their mascot. At the very least, the background of this battle is an impressive expansion on what was done on the 3DS. The location is well represented as we can see the train station, the twin boutiques, the Pokémon Center, and even the purple house with all its ivy and Pokéball symbol above the door behind Pikachu. And when the camera shows the trainer, we can see the root sign, the barn and silo, and even more tall grass. Everything is reflected in where you're battling. We also see another returning Pokémon as the trainer sends out Minchino from Gen 5. Now this could be an early game catch as it's using a level 1 move, Pound, or the player kept the move and returned here after finding Minchino later. It's difficult to say which is the case, but it's good to see the Minchino line in the game. The scene then shifts to the male trainer battling in a wintry area. Water surrounds him on all sides, while snow and frosted rocks can be seen in the background along with a signpost. On the opposite side, we see that he's trying to catch a wishy-washy from Gen 7, though oddly we can see beach chairs and umbrellas on the coast. Something that's more than a little odd. We tried to see if there are any beaches in the United Kingdom known for something like this, but it doesn't seem to be the case. Instead, there's just plenty of reports of it snowing on UK beaches. It's a cool visual, at least. It's also interesting to see that Wishy Washy can handle these cooler temperatures along with the warm waters of Alola. But one of the key takeaways here is that this is a surf encounter as both the trainer and the Pokémon are on sandbars. This is how the modern Pokémon games represent these water encounters. We still don't know how the player will surf, but it will certainly be featured. Those are wild encounters, but we also get a taste of a trainer battle. As the female trainer heads for the purple house near the lake, we see a bit of a split path. There's a lower route with some tall grass, and tall grass on the upper route behind the girl. So you can walk through there if you want to avoid the opposing trainer. That's not what happens though as our trainer continues ahead. But what's interesting is the lack of a feature. Unlike Sun and Moon, there's no indication that the trainer is about to spot you. Instead, an exclamation immediately pops up when they do. It's returned to the style of the older generations. Unfortunately, we don't see the full encounter with this girl, but there is a splash screen showcasing the beginning of the battle. We believe this girl is the Galar region's version of Alas, as she's in a school uniform like past games. More specifically, one reminiscent of British schools. This is best shown thanks to the crest on her maroon blazer, and the common style of keeping the tie short as a small act of rebellion, just like students in the real world. As the last throws her Pokeball, we get a better look at her school crest. It's pretty nondescript though, only featuring a shield-like emblem with wings and an empty scroll below where the school words would be. But this is the last we see of her as the trailer instead shows a different Pokemon trainer. This provides our first look at what we believe to be a youngster. He's dressed in a blue sweater over a yellow button-up shirt with pleated pants and matching shoes. And while it's difficult to make out exactly, we think his sweater might be emblazoned with a lampant, which would mean their line is in Sword and Shield as well. 
Although we don't know that for sure, we can definitely see that Grubbin will be here from Gen 7, but that also means that there will need to be a magnetic field in Galar so it can reach its final evolution. However, we don't actually get to see the Grubbin fight. Instead, the scene shifts to show Gen 2's Hoot Hoot using Air Slash while on a brick bridge, meaning that this is likely a trainer battle near the industrial city we spoke of before. Zoelis from Gen 5 is soon shown using Dragon Pulse in one of the snow-covered areas, while Gen 3's Flygon unleashes Uproar against Gen 5's Braviary in a canyon-like area. Now, this is a place that we haven't seen before, and while there isn't much to comment on, we do think this takes place in the maze-like area near the icy region. We can even see ladders that would allow the trainer to climb up and down multiple levels. Perhaps some places will be constructed more elaborately. The battle montage ends with a fight on the icy beach between a female Meowstic from Gen 6 and a Whalemur from Gen 3. The Whalemur is on the attack as it uses Water Spout. Now, we did already mention Lucario and Tyranitar earlier, but these are all the returning Pokémon that we've seen so far. However, there are of course three new ones as well. We're first introduced to Scorbunny, a fire rabbit that's full of energy and always running about. The patch above its nose resembles a bandage, which is somewhat of a trope in sports anime. Scorbunny is likely the jock of the group, and maybe one of its moves allows it to kick fireballs like a soccer ball. Next up is Sobble, a water lizard that is likely based on a chameleon considering its cloaking ability. It's a timid Pokémon that shoots out water attacks as it hides. Finally, there's Grookey, a grass chimp that's full of curiosity. This CG cutscene, which likely won't be in the main game, shows off a bit of their abilities with Scorbunny burning the grass, Sobble putting out the fire, and Grookey restoring it. Often, starters have some kind of theme surrounding their design, such as the Gen 6 starters being based on a knight, a wizard, and a ninja. But we're not sure what these starters' inspirations could be. One thought we had, which is likely off base, is how each one represents a type of personality. Score Bunny is the type A who's active and competitive, Grookey is more laid back and relaxed with its curiosity as a type B, while Sobble is a bit of a worrywart, making it a type D personality. Again, we're not sure if this is the case, but we noticed the correlation anyway. And that's everything that we could find in the Pokémon Sword and Shield reveal trailer. We're only just beginning to scratch the surface as the Pokémon Company is sure to slowly release more and more information about the games, including new gameplay elements and Pokémon as we get closer to its late 2019 launch date. It's absolutely an exciting time for Pokémon fans, but we're not quite done yet. There's still the Galar region map that we need to run through the old analysis machine, so be sure to stay tuned for that very soon. And of course, if we miss anything, let us know in the comments. Thanks for watching and be sure to subscribe to Game Explained for more on Pokemon and other things gaming.